Hello, and thank you for listening to this presentation. The topic of this talk is relationships and motivation in language revitalization contexts. This project draws on interviews with 28 language revitalization practitioners representing seven indigenous languages of the United States and one Creole language of Singapore. These were semi-structured interviews uh, with a question guide of, of questions that are related to language learning motivation. They were recorded over Zoom in the summer of 2020, so this past summer. And I want to point out that none of these interviewees are only language learners, uh, meaning they're involved in a lot of different kinds of language revitalization practices. Um, quite a few of them are also teachers, they are mentors, archival researchers, linguists, um, a lot of different kinds of roles. And also not all of them are working on their L2 or their second language. Uh, many of them were also L1 or heritage speakers of their language, um, but they're involved in uh, language revitalization activities. And also as one um, L1 speaker of Yupik said, we are all always learning. So they're all learners, but they're not only learners. And just to get started, since the theme of this conference is relationships and the topic of this talk is relationships, and, um, and also to honor what um, indigenous research methodology theorist Sean Wilson calls relational accountability, I just want to show you who all the people are who are part of this project. So this is me. I'm Allison. I'm a non-indigenous researcher and graduate student at the University of Oregon which is on the traditional ancestral territory of the Kalapuya people. And in my studies and in my work, I've made some relationships that are really important to me. And those include um, relationships with the people who work at the Northwest Indian Language Institute, which is also here at the University of Oregon. And through Neely and also through um, my graduate department, I've made a close friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Zamai Asuli Zahir, who works with communities in Washington State. And then through other contacts, I've been in touch with a language learning community in Singapore that's working on this language called Krisong, which is a Creole Singapore. So these are the, like the three main hubs of how I got in touch with the people that I that I interviewed that I'll talk to you about today. Um, so this is how everybody is connected. So the individual little bubbles are are the practitioners that I talked to, and the different colors represent the different languages that they are working on. Um, and the little orange arrows between some of the small bubbles mean that those people were interviewed together. Uh, so they had the option of being interviewed individually or if they wanted to share their time with a, a friend or a relative, um, they could do that. So some of them took that option. So that's the who, the what is motivation. Um, and the reason I got interested in this question initially is that a lot of uh, revitalization practitioners who have come through the University of Oregon um, have written about motivation in their work, um, the importance of motivation, the challenge of maintaining motivation, um, especially um, for some of them, they're sort of independent, uh, they're doing independent study of their own language, um, of their awakening languages and things like that. So um, motivation was a big topic. So Carson Viles actually did a, an honors thesis on this topic, and he says, we can use motivation as a lens for understanding larger issues within language revitalization, such as the existence of worldviews within endangered languages, the role of the family in learning, and the importance of community support in deterring or enabling successful language revitalization efforts. So there's actually quite a bit of research within um, second language acquisition research on the topic of language learning motivation. Um, but like many things in second language acquisition research, um, almost all of it is on global lingua francas. In fact, almost all of it is on English and learning English. Um, and this, uh, cite, the citations that you see here come from a special issue of the Modern Language Journal, where they're talking about this problem of um, this is an important topic and it would, and we need to know something about anything other than English, basically. Um, so I'm interested in this in, in these contexts. So 
I talked to these people and uh, relationships came up quite a bit in conversations about motivation. So some of the types of relationships that were mentioned include immediate family, um, children were particularly relevant, um, parents and grandparents were mentioned, um, and then all sorts of other family members, partners, uncles, nieces, nephews, all sorts. And then there's extended family. And what I mean by that is sort of generationally extended. So um, not just grandparents, but, but previous generations, ancestors, um, and not just descendants, or not just children, but descendants further into the future. Those were also mentioned. And then there's community, and that might mean the speech community in general, it might mean the learning community. Um, so your classmates, your teachers, uh, teachers also mentioned students as being motivational. And then there's um, the extended community. So that might mean the general public outside of the speech community, um, maybe uh, important relationships um, with non-tribal members, for example. Um, there's also communities of practice. And what I mean by that is, uh, language revitalization practitioners who are working in different places with different languages. So not from your own home speech community, but, but working in the same area. So those are some of the relationships that came up and, um, and I'm representing them here as sort of expanding circles of connection. Um, but I also want to, to note, and this is why I give these dashed lines, is that I've kind of drawn artificial barrier boundaries around these categories. Um, they're, they're not that cut and dry, um, but, I, but I just wanted to give you a sense of the range of different relationships that people talk about. So how do relationships motivate? There's a handy definition of motivation that I sometimes use, um, which is that it consists of the choice of a particular action, the persistence with it, and the effort expended on it. And I'm gonna use that and then tweak it a little bit to capture some themes in uh, this project. Um, so uh, I'll talk about choice, which is why did you start? Persistence, how do you keep going? Um, and then some future visions that people shared that um, centered around relationships. And then acknowledging that demotivation is also part of the process. So it's not always, um, it's not always motivation, it's sometimes the opposite. And then how do you get re-motivated when you've been frustrated or discouraged? Um, I will point out that there are many, many, many other things that um, could be talked about uh, with respect to the examples I'm going to show you. Um, identity comes up a lot, and you'll probably uh, maybe recognize that in some of what I'll show you. Uh, culture and cultural connections, history, resistance, all of these things are certainly relevant to what people shared, um, but unfortunately I won't be able to talk about uh, those things. That will be for a later time. And um, I also want to point out that because this is a rather short presentation, I won't be able to share a, a quote from everybody that, that shared their stories with me, um, but all of those contributions um, are part of this larger analysis. So I'm, I'm grateful to all of the people who talked to me. Okay, so choice. Uh, important relationships can motivate you to start learning or start working on language in the first place. So um, Charlotte, who's a learner of Le Chute Seed, she mentions her brother, who is a language teacher. And she says, um, about three years ago, his boss was really encouraging the teachers to reach out to their family and sort of grassroots recruitment to start. So he got all of us to take his language class. And then from there, we all started our own language learning journeys. So this is an immediate family member who has this like explicit pull into language work here. There's also um, an L1 heritage speaker of Chris Song who um, decided to get involved in the, the formal language classes that um, had started to be organized uh, in Singapore for Krisong language. Um, and she says, I'd actually say uh, the priest in my parish was one of those who got me thinking about really learning because he asked me, how do you say Merry Christmas in Krisong? He said, I know you're Eurasian. What do you, how do you say that? So this is somebody from a completely different 
heritage background outside the community, not a Chris Song speaker, but someone that she has a, an important relationship with. And he sort of planted the seed in her. It didn't He didn't like pull her into language work, but planted the seed um, and kind of spurred that interest. And then this is Evaristo, who's um, also a Chris Song learner. Uh, he's Brazilian and he's living in Singapore for an extended period of time. And he says, I appreciate not to be detached from what happens and to be really inside of a new society, to share things with that society. You need bridges, of course, you need to build these bridges. And then you always find these bridges departing from your preferences. And for me, language is very much a preference. So this is a case where he doesn't have a relationship and he wants to have a relationship. And so uh, language is the, the tool that he is using to, to build that relationship with a new community. So important relationships also are a key to keeping going in, in language work. Um, and I have a couple of examples of influential grandmothers. So Kayla, who is a teacher of the Schutzseed, um, though it's not her heritage language, she has a different um, heritage language, but she is working with the Lushootseed language program. And she says, uh, my grandma, she is a language teacher for our tribal language back home. And so she has always been like, you need to be doing something. I actually called her one time when I wanted to leave, not the language, just my current job. And she was like, if you're not speaking the language, you need to reassess what you're doing. So it's very um, explicit encouragement to persist from a living relative. And then Michelle shared a story of um, her grandmother who was the, the reason to start and then remembering that reason um, is how she keeps going. So she says, about five years ago, my nan, my grandmother, she got sick and I flew up to the village to visit her and she was playing some Haida music and she said, why aren't you singing? And I had no answer because I didn't know the song, because I didn't know anything really. And later she says, I stayed with her for the four days that she was still with us and I promised her I will not let our people die. And about two months later, I sold my house and I started the process of moving back home. And then Michelle closed our conversation by saying, a lot of it comes back to that's the last thing I said to my non, that promise, that's my motivation. So relationships are also the center of a lot of uh, visions for the future that people shared. Um, and there are a lot of examples of this. I'll just give you one. This comes from Erin, who is a learner of New Way Up. And she says, I would love it if my youngest niece, who's almost a year old now, if she could have kids or grandkids who can fluently speak the language. And they come and they talk to me and I'm, you know, great auntie. And they're like, oh, great auntie, you talk so weird. And I'll be like, yep, great auntie talks so weird. You talk so good. That would be my dream. So like I said, demotivation is also part of this process. And um, a lot of people talked about it. And um, the number one frustration discouragement that people mentioned is uh, lack of relationship. It's not having anybody to talk to or not having many people to talk to. Um, being lonely, that came up a lot. Um, so I, this is just another contribution from Erin because it sums it up pretty well. She says, it's just so hard to be motivated when you're by yourself. So this is from Corel and she's identifying that relationships are motivating and then lack of relationship is kind of demotivating. So she says it comes in waves. And a lot of people said this is ebbs and flows. People did sort of up and down motions. It comes in waves. She says, when I would get to hang out with people who are also really interested in trying to use the language and we'd actively try to use some of it with each other in person, that would motivate me to be like, all right, I'm going to learn these other things and I'm going to keep practicing this. And that would sort of keep the momentum going for a while. 
But then if I was on my own for a while, it would sort of, I feel like my motivation would kind of fall off. And this is something that comes up um, a lot given the context that we were having these conversations. Um, people who don't, they're cut off from their usual community activities, usual social activities, um, given the pandemic and the state of remote and isolated um, contexts uh, at that time. So it came up a lot. Uh, so relationships are also mentioned as being the impetus for getting past moments of frustration. So um, this is from Carson who works on New Way Up. And he says, um, it's the same thing with everything. It's more of a roller coaster when you're alone in terms of motivation and demotivation. That's been my experience is finding community really helps accelerate the work, even if that community is across different languages or experiences or different places in terms of where you are as learners. So he has actually reached out to uh, practitioners in other language communities um, to help him uh, stay motivated though he, he's uh, doesn't have a, a lot of people within his own language that he can talk to all the time. And then the other side of language learning that is very frustrating, and any language learner will probably identify with this, is that um, it's hard, uh, things are weird, you're bad at it, um, or you feel bad at it, um, you're frustrated, it's difficult, it's exhausting, a lot of this comes up, and then people also acknowledge when they have teachers or classmates that work really hard to get to take away some of those demotivation, some of those frustrations. So, for example, um, Tej, who's a learner of Chris Song, says uh, she's also. I've also felt that urge, like, oh, I can't. I just really want to rest today. I don't really want to go to class. Um, but once I get to class, I will remember how much fun it is and how accessible it is. So a lot of people uh, talked about fun and, um, and how, how important relationships make things fun and take away some of that uh, unease. So there's practical implications here. One is that um, people talk about just needing the barriers to motivation to be lowered uh, in some sense. Um, and so people often said that what was really encouraging is when a particularly important person just acknowledged that loneliness and frustration and discomfort can be part of the process. Um, just hearing that acknowledged um, made them feel okay and made them feel like they could move forward. So that's a big part of it. And then also the importance of encouraging relationship building. Um, so people talked about uh, really appreciating when there were opportunities for informal interactions. So just chatting with your friends, sharing a meal, that kind of thing, not necessarily like really formal language. We are now in the classroom going to do this, but um, all sorts of different types of interactions. And then especially given the, the, this era, um, facilitating communication, uh, even in isolation. So people talked about WhatsApp groups and chat groups and just staying in touch. So there's also theoretical implications. And I think the big theoretical implication is that relationship is crucial. Um, so Jackie, in, in saying what she would, what advice she would give to a new learner, she said, just recognize the importance of knowing your why. And for Jackie, her why is her dad. And she says, I also have a, I have a huge soft spot for my dad and I love him and respect him. I hope that I can give him some pieces of connection and that he and I can keep connecting over these things. Uh, that it so really boils down to the relational connection piece for me. That's a really big part of it, my dad specifically and our relationship. So there's actually a reciprocity here. It is, it is relationships and language learning have this reciprocal relationship. And there are a couple of other examples. This is from Chris D who works on the shoot seed. And he says, one of the byproducts of this work is just that people in, um, in our office with all of us, I've realized that of the eight people I'm related to all but one. And if I'm sure that I can probably dig far enough back to find some sort of link to that other person. And then this is from Chris B, who also works on the shoot seed. And he says, my grandpa used to say, the bear is our relative. We know from the old stories, we're related. The bear and humans are related. And he used to call the bear Siaya. And so that's what I thought the word for bear was growing up. And then when I started studying and working for the language department, there's other words for bear. Uh, and so I always just thought, well, maybe he was using the Yakima word for bear. 
And then I realized Siaya is relative. He's literally calling the bear relative. So in conclusion, um, this question of motivation uh, comes up in a lot of second language research just because um, it is it is theorized that strong motivation or maybe a particular kind of motivation might be the key to long-term language success. So it might be uh, what you need to get to push you from point A to point B, basically. And what I think this project has shown is that um, influential relationships absolutely do uh, motivate commitment and motivate effort in language work. So there is that motion. Um, but it's also true that language work then in turn deepens relationships and deepens connections. And so there's, um, it's, it's relational, it is not a linear process. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you to all of my interviewees and thank you to the conference organizers and I look forward to your questions.